get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I'm here with Kelly Johnson, the Ballast Group. I'm going to introduce her in a second. I always like to mention Kelly past episodes, which are interesting. And uh, I think last time we talked, this is actually, I rarely have someone on for a second time. So if you haven't checked out the other interview I did with Kelly, check it out. This is going to be really, she just gives us rock solid, amazing. A uh, piece of information and presentation on branding and storytelling strategy. So I was like, would you be open? And usually she presents in kind of smaller group, private settings. And I was like, would you be open to sharing that on my podcast? And she said, yes. So um, this is going to be amazing. She's going to actually present this. And um, it, it was super valuable when I watched it. And I, I could probably watch it several more times. So I'm um, appreciating Kelly for sharing this. P- you know, check out. You can check out Andrea Houston, of uh, founder of R2's Design. Uh, she hosts Lead Like a Woman show. And um, Andrea Herrera of Boxperience, which delivers customized wooden crates filled with goodies. I'm always looking at uh, what interesting things I could send to people, Kelly, that creates a bit of a wow experience. And so that's one thing that is on my list. And before I formally introduce Kelly, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. And at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships by helping you run your podcast. And, you know, for me, if you haven't listened before, if you have, you know, I know I really focus in on relationships and in my number one thing in my life is relationships. So I always look at ways to give to that, my relationships. And over the past 10 years of podcasting, I can profile the people and companies I admire like Kelly. So if you've thought of podcasting, I believe you should, and you can check out rise25.com. And Kelly Johnson, uh, she found the Ballast Group. It's an award-winning integrated communication strategy firm. And she has served on some really big companies. She was director of corporate marketing for Abbott Laboratories, managing the corporate communications for Tropicana, which is a multi-billion dollar division of PepsiCo, I remember as a kid, you know, having huge containers of Tropicana or refrigerator. The Ballast Group helps to build domestic brands of global companies and provides lead generation and growth strategies for startup companies as well. They're focused on all aspects of marketing, uh, consumer products, healthcare, and high-tech services. They've helped companies like Hyatt, Safeway, Target, Stericycle, Cisco, and so many more. And there's a lot of different case studies they have on the ballastgroup.com slash case studies. And they basically position companies also as thought leaders through media relations, including U.S. News and World Report, Associated Press, CNN, Wall Street Journal, and so many more. So, Kelly, thank you for joining me. And I'll let you kind of take it from here with branding and storytelling strategies. Sure, Jeremy. Thank you. I had no idea that um, I was you barely take on a guest twice. So thank you. Uh, it's quite an honor to be here. And uh, we have we had fun, so much fun the last time you always put your interviewees at, at ease. Um, so I appreciate that. And thank you for the kind words. So um, as you mentioned, I started Ballast Group. It's been 17 years now, which is so hard to believe. Um, I came out of Fortune 500 and then I got into the startup world and um, I moved back into Fortune 500 thinking I was cut out for it um, after 15 years and realized, you know what? I love the startup world. And so I kind of got back into that with um, consulting to a gentleman by the name of Keith Ferrazzi, who wrote the book, Never Eat Alone. And I, it's a book I principles. I, I love that book. Kid. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, you never want to do anything alone, whether you're working out or, or going to get some quick bite to eat or networking, whatever it may be. Um, always make sure you think of others and how, what you can do for them as well as what they can do for you. So his book, um, we, you know, we lived that for 18 months. And then I decided I was going to start the ballast group because I, um, I wanted to do something different, with, especially with PR. It's, it's a, it's a field I love. I've been telling stories since I was a kid. I'm actually an identical twin. And so I feel like I've spent my life trying to dig deep to find the unique in somebody or a product or a service or solution. And so I can, I can kind of geek out about that because I always want to find the differences. And um, that's what we love to do. And mostly, as you mentioned, it's with well-funded healthcare and entrepreneur, um, healthcare and technology entrepreneurs. So they're disruptive, they're innovative, they're, 
we, we help them put things on the map, um, sometimes overnight. And I'll share a couple examples of how we do that. It's uh, again, why I love what I do. And I think another thing to note too, is that when we go out on your own, you know, you're on your own, I'm on my own. It takes a lot of guts to do that. I didn't think I had it. And I, I didn't start my business until I was probably 38. And I wish I had done it 10 years earlier, but you don't know until you go after it. So um, having a set of values kind of reshape the way I think about things. And um, I mentioned this on the first cast, if anyone um, is able to listen to that again, as you mentioned, um, ours are curiosity because in our field of PR, if you don't have it, you, you're dead right in the water. And then um, teamwork is a big one. Got to have each other's backs and then accountability, do what you say you're going to do. And if you can't, you know, get a quick, get another plan, plan quickly. So, um, and then of course, transparency and honesty, but sometimes I take those for given, but not everybody does them. So um, having a set of values was what set the foundation for Ballast Group. I love sailing in the water, I'm an Aquarian. And so ballast is a nautical term, right? So I'll, I'll, move, um, I'll move down a slide here to show you. I wanna um, point something out, Kelly, for a second. If you are listening just to the audio, that's fine. I would encourage you to go to the post on Inspired Insider, where there will be a full video because she is actually going to be going through some slides. So, yeah. So, um, ballast, uh, you know, the, the little literal term is, is an engineering term. It's nautical materials carried temporarily or permanently to give desired stead steadiness or stability. And I feel like we do that for our clients. So, we're going to help you tell your story. Sometimes CEOs know what their story is or it needs to be refined. Others have no idea and they want to turn to us. So, then we say, well, what, who's your most important audience? Who is this really going to be targeted to? And then what channels, because there's, there's dozens of channels now, as you know, with social media and um, all kinds of things that we're going to talk about in a second. And then how are you going to move you forward to reach your, your business goals? If our PR goals or marketing goals are not aligned with the business, um, we're not adding value and that's, that's not good. So um, a, a quick uh, snapshot, you know, if you come to me and ask me what we do, I will speak pretty high level in a slide like this. We use a peso model, paid, earned, shared, and owned media. Now we're going to dive into what all those types of campaigns are. We really believe in what we call the inverted pyramid methodology for telling your story. So a lot of CEOs and organizations want to be at the top of the pyramid, right? We, we are who we are. And I said, no, we're going to flip that pyramid and flip, flip the script, we call it. And we're going to talk first about why people are going to care about your story. There's always some, some nugget that, that latches them in. And then we'll find those third parties that will help you tell the story with you, not sometimes for you, but mostly with you. Because people know the company's drinking their Kool their own Kool Aid, right? So the third parties that can help you share your story are our goal. Um, we put your story into action by laying that foundation, figuring out what the messaging is going to be, who are those influencers that can help you tell it, looking at the content from all angles, and then aligning that to your brand. And finally, how do you outreach to those audiences to help them tell the story with you? And um, I've got a lot of different kind of case studies. I believe very profoundly that, you know, what we do can be quantified and qualified. And so we should be sharing what we do in, um, in these little nuggets that I like to say, because um, we've got a lot of them and we've helped, you know, some companies shares go from $48 to $149, letting their hospital customers talk for them or um, looking at who are the, the biggest foodie Instagrammers to help America's first online grocery company come back into the market space. Um, all the way to a caregiving company that was in a crowded space of 700 something other care, um, caregiving firms in the country was in Chicago and we helped them stand out um, to find the right kind of caregivers in a very high crisis of shortage of caregivers. So that goes back to the why and why are you doing what you're doing? What problem are you solving? So we're going to go into a couple of those, including a real recent one related to COVID. Um, I think it's quite interesting to see what, why people call us, right? They want to launch a company or a product or service. They um, oftentimes, I mentioned they're well-funded healthcare and technology companies, and that means they're probably going to prepare for merger and acquisition potential. So how do we help them get noticed by the right people? A lot of times I want to stand out from the competition. Um, somebody's coming in their space. They get nervous. They say, we've owned this space for 20 years. We don't want anyone to take over. We help them figure out how they can keep that, that standout status. Um, they have something big they want to announce. Um, they build relationships stronger with, with audiences they don't yet have it. And then sometimes they just want to go, they want to grow, whether it's um, nationwide in this country or even outside. And ultimately, all of what we do moves the needle for these organizations um, in a pretty neat way. Kelly, with how so, big, go back really quickly to announce something big. How far in advance are they contacting you for that? 
we've had months and we've had weeks. Uh, I would say days, like seven to eight days sometimes, including this recent COVID um, antigen rapid, rapid antigen test that won a big prize and wanted to put an announcement out like four days later. Um, and, you know, it was quite a scramble. Um, and I have that, I'll, I'll share that with you later. So sometimes people plan and sometimes they don't, sometimes they don't know, right? If they're going to win something, they, they like to plan on it, but, but you just don't know. Is there an ideal situation? Like we're planning something big. Let's say they do have the luxury of time and it doesn't just come out of the blue. What, what would be an ideal time to call someone like you to work on it? We, we work swiftly and I would say ideal is three months. We use the norm is usually one month. Um, and the anomaly is the one week, <laughs> but we can do it. We pulled it off. Thanks. Yeah. I just wanted to, to ask that. So. Sure. Um, so I'll take you into, you know, I told you about a little bit about the, about the peso model, right? So peso stands for paid, earned, shared, and owned media, different types of media that we work with. And um, those are the four buckets. I mean, there, it's a very big um, segment. There's probably 50 different marketing and PR initiatives within the peso model. And then sandwiched in between the paid and the earned is your thought leadership. How do you stand out? How do you continue to be known as a thought leader as an organization or a CEO? And then in between the earned and the shared is going to be um, something we call influencer engagement, right? You know who those influencers are out there. How do you get their attention? And how do you keep them engaged? And then how do you take it even further where they start engaging their network for you on their behalf? So um, it comes back to that third party storytelling and the inverted pyramid. And then planning, um, we have a six step methodology for how we get our clients maximum visibility. So here's the peso you know, at a very high level, um, paid, earned, shared, and owned. And Ideally, Jeremy, those, those three-month um, planners, the people that will plan like a big announcement three months later are probably the ones that are going to want a, a big a, a partner like Ballast Group to partner with them for a year or so. That's what most of our agreements are. We're, we want to be a partner to somebody. We don't want to be a transactional, I need a press release out tomorrow, or can you post something for me? I mean, that's, we, we look it's part at of a larger strategic campaign. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mentioned there's lots of channels. So on the paid side, um, you know, we look at website audits, we do look at social posts, there's digital strategy on Google, um, pay-per-click and search engine marketing. And um, as you can see here, Litany, I won't run through all the lists, but paid is a very strategic part. A lot of it's data-driven and um, a decent budget, right? Because there's services fees that you pay us to manage them, but then there's also Google and LinkedIn and Facebook. I think it is interesting to go through because there's some on here that I like shopping networks. I wouldn't necessarily have thought of that. Yeah, e-commerce, right? So it depends if you're B2B or B2C, um, but there's all kinds of paid approaches that you can do. And sometimes people just do the paid part, um, but we believe in the value of integrating. If someone has the time and the resources and the budget, integration is a way to go because you want people to see your brand in lots of different places, not just on one. Um, and paid's good, um, but you know, the algorithms change, Google's changing their algorithm now, and uh, Facebook does all the time. So it's hard to keep up um, if you're not truly in the digital space. And this is a thought leadership I mentioned that kind of uh, a seesaw between paid and earned where you do your research, you figure out what the marketplace is, is talking about. What are people's whys? Um, most people have a good sense of why they exist or they wouldn't have started the company in the first place, but helping them refine it is something we'd love to do. And a lot of that comes with that third party focus. So we start every engagement by saying, hey, Give us 10, 12, 15, 20 of your stakeholders for us to interview because we're going to go get their perspective and we're going to blend it with your perspective. And oh, by the way, on top of it, we're going to do some Google searching and we're going to come up with what other people are positioning, things that relate to your industry in, in the marketplace. And so we blend the three primary, secondary, and, um, and your, your stakeholder interviews with the leadership team into the narrative. And um, Sometimes CEOs say, I can just tell you what it is. They're like, I know you can tell me what it is, but you know what? Does the marketplace believe that? And will it be credible when we start telling it if it's just one-sided leadership point of view? Sometimes they end up mirroring them themselves. Um, so that's a good thing. But a lot of times uh, the, the external marketplace might say something a little bit different. So it shapes our, our narrative. We out, we're out there social listening. There's lots of tools like Radian 6 or Crimson Hexagon that if you're a global brand, you want to know every time your brand's being mentioned um, at any time around the world. And the bigger you grow, that that's a challenge, you know, to keep your pulse on it. Um, and then, you know, your domain, your web, how much, how attractive is your web to Google searches? Um, that's going to go back to the domain authority and your search engine optimization. 
And then um, again, we're are big believers in quantifying how does your campaign do and, and all the different analytical tools that come with that. Earned, earned is one of my favorite types of media because I started, I cut my teeth at the Pointer Institute for Media Studies in St. Petersburg, Florida as part of my master's program. And I tell you, they are good. And as a student, I could take a one week course with journalists from all around the country. I mean, there was some, some Martha Rabbits that covered the Pentagon for years and um, uh, uh, Keith um, that wrote, the, he wrote Thur, Thurgood Marshall's auto, uh, biography, not auto, he wrote the biography. Um, and he, and this is, these are journalists that care about what they do. And it was an eye opener moment for me when I realized that these guys care about their, their role, but they're not licensed. And in our field, licensing has been a talk for decades. And, you know, here I am way well over the half of a hump of my career, and they're still talking about it. So we have a very big responsibility when we work with journalists to get things right the first time and make sure the data and statistics are quantifiable um, and that they can go fact check them. And that's a, that's a pretty big role, um, you know, for when you write for millions of readers and viewers every day. Yeah, it's um, a big responsibility. Yeah, and journalists, I, I really respect journalists because they look through lenses. Um, they're trained from J school to be fair, accurate, and balanced. And, um, you know, sometimes to their own personal, they don't really share their personal feelings a lot because they're so wanting to get the other side right and show two or three sides to every story. Um, so that's a tough stakeholder to manage. Um, and that's why getting a, a journalist or a producer or an editor to say your story is worthy means a lot. And that's why they call it earned media. It's, it's tough to get. Influencer engagement sits in between there too. Um, we can do, we've done some advocacy relations work where a startup in cell therapy had, you know, was not known at all. It was just coming out of clinical trials. And we found the nonprofits that support their field of orthopedics and pain management and sports management, um, regenerative medicine, which is cell therapy. And uh, at the end of six months, there was 10 organizations that were then super impressed with, why didn't I know about you guys? And, and they became our advocates um, on social media, on speaking engagements and patient trials for recruiting, um, as well as conducting trials. So it's a pretty big deal when you know who those advocates are in your industry and you can, can approach them and say, hey, there's somebody you need to learn about. And then all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and they say, gosh, let me get this out to my network too. And that's really beautiful in, in advocacy. Um, investor relations too. We have a, a we had a, a nationwide medical waste company that said, "Uh oh, waste management's getting into healthcare. We should be worried, even though we dominate the space, because waste management serves every single household in America." And so they specifically, the VP of marketing told us, "We hired you because we need you to help us stand out fast." And that's when we said, "Well, who are you talking to?" And I looked at their website and I talked to some people. And I'm like, hmm, "Pretty much an investor relations company, right? It's all about the stock and the shareholders instead of the." market that they serve, which is 5,000 hospitals nationwide and primary care clinics and offices. Um, and so this is an example, Jeremy, that I mentioned early about the stock price went from $48 to 147 in seven years, because guess what? Others were talking about them and not them. And we, we tied the narrative into greening healthcare. So keeping drugs out of the public water supply and keeping um, plastic recyclable sharps containers also out of landfills. So um, it, was, it was a great message. And when the hospital's customers started talking about it in the marketplace, they didn't need to. So Jim Kramer of Mad Money started calling us. You know, you, you see the quantifiable results of when third parties start talking. So there's a lot of different types of influencers like that. Um, shared media is also called social media, right? It, it's shareable. It's, and it's beautiful for that reason, but it's also a two-way, sometimes three-way dialogue. And um, when social media first started coming out, I know CEOs and corporate executives were very nervous about, well, gosh, it's a two-way dialogue. We're not used to that, right? We're used to our website or our blog or our email campaign saying exactly what we want to say. And now we're opening it up for the world to comment on. And it was a big aha moment for a lot of companies. And today, thankfully, you know, 10, 12 years later, it's the norm. And engaging online is something that is expected of a brand and marketing. And back to sometimes tying customer service into social media, the team reports right under service, which is under marketing. And therefore, they can nip an issue in the bud a minute immediately when it starts to be talked about on social media instead of letting it get on the front page of the Wall Street Journal the next day. <laughs> so um, shared is very important. I know you, uh, Kelly, and other people, a common one is commenting about airlines because flights are not and how people react. I mean, they're all going to be they're all going to have issues of being late or delayed. They're, I would never want to be in that industry. It's just so you don't control of the weather. You don't control a lot of things, 
but you do have control about how you respond to those situations, you know? Right, right. And a lot of pastors sitting in the airport have a lot of time to get on their Twitter or LinkedIn <laughs> or Facebook and say, United or American or Delta, come on, you know, why did you cancel my flight? I want to get home tonight. And I have gotten responses quite quickly. All it does is make you feel better that somebody listened to you, but it didn't change the fact that you got home at three in the morning. <laughs> but it's a brand talking to you when you feel lost sometimes with millions of stakeholders. So um, you can see there's tons of channels, right? To talk, talk to on social media. Um, TikTok's fairly new, Snapchat. It's, it's, um, it's a brand thing, right? If you're B2C or B2B or even government, B2G, it's, it's, um, you've got to pick the right channels of where your stakeholders are. And that takes a little bit of research to, to figure out. Um, developing content and making it consistent and engaging and not always about you is, is huge. Um, companies sometimes want to talk about themselves. And we always say, let's inform people, educate them first. And oh, by the way, if we happen to talk about our brand 20% of the time, that's great, but you don't want it any more than that, or, or it gets to be disgenuine and people tune out. Um, they won't, they won't um, comment or share or engage with you. And again, always go back to metrics and measuring goals. Every one of the platforms has an analytics tool as well as Google Analytics. So you want to look at your website and where, where are you sending traffic? We like to say your website is the hub. Every campaign we do in paid, earned, shared, and owned drives people back to your website. So it's got to be a good site. It's got to say what you want. It's got to be easy to get through. Um, and again, quantifying where the traffic is coming from each of those channels to your site. And finally, own media. I mean, this is, again, 100% of what you can and want to say. And a lot of that makes people feel really good. Um, I think blogging is important. Um, topically, I still think it should not be too commercial. It should be more educational, um, sprinkled in with the occasional, your brand and um, identity there. But there's lots of things you can own and say 100% of what you want to say. So um, I would, you know, I, again, I think um, tying your customer relationship management program into your own media is important too. And making sure that um, you're connecting in some way, in some channel with your stakeholders every single day. Videos, uh, YouTube is the largest search engine and social media platform in the world. And most people don't know that. It's almost 2 billion users watching almost a billion hours of uh, video every single day. So um, it's, a, it's a channel we're going to start using a lot more of because um, it's more engaging. Even every single social post, if you're not using video, you're missing an opportunity. Um, even Jeremy, you're podcasting, right? We're recording this because people like to see people, especially during an age of isolation when for over a year, we haven't been able to do a lot of that. This will be going on YouTube as well. Yeah, oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> So I've spoken about the inverted pyramid. I believe strongly in it that, you know, the right side of this diagram, why people should care should always be the way you lead with a story. And then finding those third party folks to communicate with you. And by the nature of doing those two things well, you're going to shine. You just will. You'll, you will be the story, even though you don't think it in the beginning. Here's, I mentioned six steps of how we look at um, getting our clients in the news, right? Building that foundation of research from the leadership's perspective, from primary interviews one-on-one -on -one with folks to the secondary research of your Google searches and what is the industry saying and um, who are who is your competition? A lot of our startup CEOs will say, we don't have any, that's why we're a startup, that's why we're cutting edge, that's why we're disrupting something. I said, we always run it through a journalistic lens. So if a journalist, if I, if I call a journalist right now and say, you need to meet this CEO, they're, they're solving a, such a big problem. And they'll say, oh yeah, that's similar to X, Y, Z. And, and you wanna say, no, it's not. <laughs> But that's how a journalist thinks. So we try to train CEOs and C-levels to think that way, that there's always somebody you're going to be compared to, and there might be two or three. And we want you to shine. We're going to try for you to shine the highest, but there will be comparative companies that are put up against you. Um, so again, influencers look at engaging content all the time. Um, don't get complacent at all. Align what you're doing with a playbook. Um, that playbook should be recalibrated all the time. What's working, what's not, that's driven by the metrics from those platforms we talked about. And then constantly outreaching to build relationships for our organizations with those influencers that I mentioned. So like, real quick on those, really quick on those six. So um, when we have um, the foundation, the core messaging, the influencers, number four content calendars, five brand alignment, and six outreach, is there a common one? that people make <clears throat> biggest mistakes on or common to that they're, they're missing in this? I think core messaging, if you don't, 
get what the marketplace will believe and you want to just go with your own story that's own media again, that's what you would write on your website or email marketing or your blogs, 100% of what you can say. I think that they miss the lens that the world is going to put you through instead of just their lens. So sometimes they're too close to it. And that's why the stakeholder interviews, like just going out, I mean, every six months would be ideal, but a lot of people just do research once a year. Sometimes we uncover, we're a third party, so they're going to tell us more. And sometimes we uncover service issues or sales issues that they, for some reason, they feel more comfortable telling a third party like Ballast Group instead of going right to their, their, um, their partner's, uh, partner's email or their voicemail or live. So uh, we bring it to their attention. So I think messaging and being realistic and especially authentic in this day and age, it's no longer about what the company wants to say, but how is it being perceived through a lot of different filters? Yeah, I could see how someone telling a third party is way easier than telling them themselves. Um, and they'll be more open and honest, typically. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, if something's not, a product's not working, we hear about it, right, in our interviews. They're not extensive interviews. They're just enough to get a sense of the perspective and point of view about the company that are, is our client and the, and the industry they're competing in and why, um, what, what it means to them. So it's intriguing. We love, we love the research. The research and the metrics are what drive, I think, why we can quantify what we do so well um, because we're looking at a lot of different stakeholders. It can be stressful. I mean, we have our client, but then we have their customers or their investors or the news media or the communities they serve. And so we're balancing all these different stakeholders every day in our heads for our campaigns for them. And it gets a little stressful. But once you learn to look through that multiple kaleidoscope of a lens for, um, for clients, they don't do it every day. They shouldn't do it every day. That's what our job is. Um, the light bulb goes off and they're like, ah, oh, I get it now. Like you got to connect all these different dots to see how your core messaging is being perceived in the marketplace and then recalibrate it with metrics. Um, what posts are doing well, what, um, how much traffic is being driven by your site and why. So, um, we'll talk about some, some different strategies. We talk about the paid and the organic social media. There's, there's sometimes digital marketers love to be in the, just the paid side, but we're seeing more and more that want to get on the organic content as well, um, or just own social media in general. And keeping up with the platforms, not everybody's right for TikTok or Snapchat. You know, you've got to really say, maybe I should be smart and just focus on two good channels to begin with. We're going to really start a, a digital health platform for seniors 75 and above. Now, it's not the B2C market, it's the B2B because the healthcare payers insurers will pay for their members to use this service. Um, and so by the nature of their platform, it fits right onto their TV and can be easily accessed with a remote control. Um, they're generating user content video all day long. And so we said, it's a no brainer. We've got to get, you've got to be on YouTube, right? With the right um, types of messages um, to reach not just the senior, senior members and their families, but more importantly, the ones that are going to be paying for those services for those seniors. So um, looking at a B2B YouTube strategy has been kind of fun and YouTube is just is big. <laughs> We're going to love it. I'm excited to get started. These are, you know, some of the third party um, implied endorsements that the news media give you when they do write about you. I said it's hard to get in all these. Uh, when you see a story in the newspaper, it didn't just happen and to appear that day. Months and months of work went into that. And um, the editors and reporters take their jobs very seriously. I would say TV and print are very different. So when you do interview for um, TV, you got to prepare for quick sound bites and a visual picture that you're painting with your words. Whereas a print reporter is, is cerebral and they're going to go deep and they're going to be probably interviewed two or three different times for a thousand word story. So there are very different types of interviews to, to get into. But the bottom line is they're earned. Um, they're not easy to get into at all. Um, crisis and reputation management. We haven't talked a lot about that, but I think everything you do ties into reputation management and you can be very proactive about it, constantly scanning the um, Google alerts and the industry and your customer base to see like, well, what issues are out there that could affect our industry? And then hopefully, you know, it doesn't end up in a crisis, but you're planning for that by identifying every single potential issue in your industry. When I worked for the juice company, Tropicana, every winter, inevitably, we were on the, uh, the crisis quality team and people back wash their pills when they're taking their juice in the morning. Right. So all of a sudden they think the product's been tampered with. So it was almost inevitable that, that, um, we had to plan for the tampering type, the tampering type of issue that could come up in our industry. So the, the, the point is, is whatever industry you're in, make a list of issues that could happen and just be ready for them. Put them in some type of playbook, whether it's digital or in your head or, or written down somewhere 
it's important to know so uh, so that you can address it before it gets into a big big trouble. Uh, be strategic about it, right? What what risks do you have? How do you position around certain conflicts, whether it's labor uh, labor or product quality or supply chain or um, is there going to be enough of something to 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 meet the U.S.'s need? In this case, you know, PPE uh, and gloves and and masks for for a crisis like what we had globally. It's um, every industry probably has at least twenty different issues they can manage. And then um, when you have to react to a crisis, and we had a recent one of a former employee accusing an employer of money laundering and racketeering. So when it's happening, it's happening fast. And you're on the phone with the legal, the legal team, the president, uh, all the way up right to and, and into these many different departments to manage it every single day. Um, you don't really sleep during crisis. So it's not a fun place to be in. But um, sometimes being reactive is not a choice. Um, things happen. And then recovery is how do you restore that reputation? How do you um, get others to start talking about you to help ease that pain? And then also be authentic with the public by saying, Mea culpa. This is what happened. This is what what we're doing to make it right. And here's what's going to change. And until you say those three things, a lot of the people don't believe that you're um, being genuine about a crisis. It's just going to happen again. So these four proactive, um, strategic, proactive, um, reactive and recovery are all what make up reputation management. Um, and it's always good to have a plan. If you are in that reactive um, in the moment, the hot seat, um, Warren Buffett, we love what he says, get it right, get it fast, get it out and get it over in crisis. So have a 24 hour blueprint um, for what's gonna happen at first 24 hours when something really bad happens. Usually, um, you know, the, the highest rule to remember is put the public safety first, no matter what's happening. Um, and then be accessible, don't, you know, give information, make it timely until the issues resolve and take responsibility for the problem and, and solve it. Let people know what you're doing to solve it. What's gonna change? If you don't say what's gonna change, everyone thinks it's gonna happen again. Um, prioritize your audiences and get out there often. I would say like a 24 seven central command center, sometimes they're digital today. They used to be in a war room of a conference room and that's where people slept on cots and whatever to solve what needed to be solved. But set up a central base somewhere and, and let one person know, be that single point of contact to know where the issues lie. And, and also to be a spokesperson for media. Be honest, you know, apologize again when necessary. Don't hide stuff. It's so obvious when, when companies are hiding things. Saying no comment is a way of that. Uh, I think that surveys show no comment always means guilt. So it's it's just it's just appropriate to say um, what you can at the time you have the information. And then again, uh, monitor and log all the news. The reporters have a job to do. I know they might sound like they're bugging you, like give me an answer, give me an answer, but they're trying to update the public with some critical information in a lot of, a lot of times. Um, and then you know they have deadlines. Be respectful of them, and if that creates that relationship where in nine times out of 10, if you show cooperation and you know that they have a job to do too, they will treat you well and fair in an interview. So um, that is crisis. Now we serve, have served a lot over the last 17 years um, of, of different types of clients. And so because we have a medical slant, I did, a, did this little uh, helical spiral, so do and little molecular. DNA, <laughs> DNA at its right? finest. It has it. So it's been a fun ride. I never thought it would be 17 years so far, but yes, indeed. Um, a lot of times when we start projects, when people are the most objective, we'll say to uh, the C-level team, so in three months or six months or nine months, what does success look like to you? And sometimes CEOs are very, well, they get to the CEO spot for a reason, right? Because they are leaders, they are decisive. Um, and one CEO said to us, he was in the medical simulation space where he helped doctors and hospitals and, and their administrative teams say, hey, if we have a chance to work on a simulated patient, um, we should, right? Because it's going to minimize medical errors. And so this gentleman looked at me and he said, I want to be on the cover of Fortune magazine as the most feared man in medicine, because if we have a solution that can help them reduce the $100,000 100, medical errors that are happening every year, then shame on that C-level team for not bringing the solution um, to these doctors to practice on a simulated patient instead of a, um, a real patient. So he knew, he knew it exactly. And that helps us shape, okay, who does he wanna reach with what message? And it was, it was fear, like why make medical errors when you don't have to? So that's always a great question to ask of anybody when you are looking at um, what does success look like in three, six, nine months. I mentioned this cell therapy client in Colorado that's orthobiologics focused. They're phenomenal. It's a really smart team. 
They worked behind the scenes for about eight years before they said, hey, it's time to start getting our message shaped and figuring out uh, what audiences we need to talk to for when uh, FDA approval might come since our product's being evaluated right now. Um, it's a really, really cool thing to use your own cells to heal your body. It's just, they just kind of know what to do when they're dropped in the body. In this case, it's for knee pain. And uh, wh which one of us doesn't have knee pain or joint pain of some kind, right? So today, the way it's done is you replace the entire joint. There is no knee left, right? It's metal or plastic. But when you can start looking at your own cells to heal the, um, uh, the pain and the functionality that you're lim limited with as you get and as you age, um, that's minimally invasive. There's less cost, there's less time involved. And um, it's been really exciting to look at, they, they had um, the resources to put an integrated plan together, Pater and shared and own media. And um, it was a Silver Trump Award winner in 2019. Um, that was for our advocacy award um, for bringing unknown organizations to them that they had no idea about and vice versa. And in the space of sports management, pain management, regenerative medicine, to put them on the map, right? Even though the product may not be approved, or if it is, it will be several years out, they still wanted to know about it. And in the scientific world, they're used to waiting several years for something novel to happen anyway. So um, website traffic up 63%. This is a one-year campaign. Um, there was a variety of media channels that covered the, this company. Um, there was, you know, with the FDA, it's constantly being reminded that you cannot make any kind of safety or efficacy claims. Um, so if a, if a solution is durable and effective and the data is showing that, great. Let's talk about the data, but um, you have to be really careful with these types of clients when you're not making claims that you shouldn't be making. Um, so I'll give you a great example. The Denver Business Journal covered the company and a, an editor wrote the title, this could potentially eliminate total knee replacements. And gee, that sounds really great for our client, right? Um, happy day. But when you look back and say, what will the FDA say about this? And if we promote this piece, that's probably not a good thing because it means we agree with the fact that it could eliminate it when we can't make those kind of claims ahead of time. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose some. It definitely did direct a very high level strategic partner to them, but we had to pull the article down because by putting it on our site and that we were promoting what the title said and we can't promote that under the FDA. So it was one of those, oh, darn moments, you know, where we knew that- Tim, the, put an asterisk somewhere. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, the, the earned media was very helpful in some regards, and you just have to be very careful when you're dealing with um, regulatory approvals. Social media, same thing, lots of shares happening, um, lots of key opinion leaders from um, some of their influencers, like the Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic, we're starting to notice them. So people are watching, and that's a really good thing, and that's what we were hired to do. Same thing with the website. Um, you know, the views go up with blogs, with videos, with email campaigns driving people to it. Um, this is constantly what you want is this integrated approach to getting your stakeholders to see you in lots of different channels. Open Arms was uh, the Chicago-based professional home care agency saturated with you know, 700 plus different uh, other caregiving agencies around how in the world are we going to make them stand out? Especially you know, if you go back to the why people are going to care and you go back to the, the inverted pyramid of finding those third parties to help you tell it, the why was this is there's a tsunami of aging Americans coming out. 10,000 people a day are aging into Medicare. So that means caregivers are going to be needed. And guess what? It's not a very high paid position. It's not a very thankful position. It's a very difficult position. And so um, the, the news became the shortage of caregivers. And every one of us should be concerned that has parents in their 70s and 80s that are going to need a caregiver. Because guess what? If we can't find them, we're doing it. And there's a lot of family caregivers over professional caregivers. It gets a little. Um, it's, it's very taxing on the family members to be at that stage and managing kids as well as jobs on top of um, caring for a parent. So um, anticipating this shortage, the agency needed to grow pretty quickly by identifying those qualified caregivers. So we did, uh, we had a Daily Herald column. We had um, a Chicago Tribune front page of the business section right around the holidays when everyone's relaxing at home and they're reading and, and enjoying the holidays. Um, and figuring out like, okay, I'm with my grandparents, I'm with my, my, my parents, what are we doing? And let's talk about it as a family. So those two articles alone drove a ton of traffic and awareness to them. Um, we found out that, again, their clients are good partners. They tell us when, when things happen. And so we know that it fueled revenue in average from three different prospects from just the Tribune article of over $150,000. 
um, and 55,000 people viewed targeted social media campaigns in just four months. So um, again, they are very well run. Julie Collada runs the Open Arms and we're very pleased to partner with them. And it was also an award-winning campaign. SimSuite was the one I mentioned to you about the simulation. Um, this is the gentleman that said I want to be the most feared man in medicine on the cover of Fortune. We did not get him the cover of Fortune, but we did get him US News and World Report, which was at the time 2 million in circulation um, and over, you know, um, ad dollar equivalency. If you had to pay to get in that publication, it would have been over $200,000. So you kind of weigh, like, how do I measure getting a client in the news? And that's how you would measure it is through what you would have to do to pay to pay your way in advertising in that publication. So um, it just so happened that the, the reporter of that publication happened to edit the best hospitals in America edition every single year. So he knew what he was talking about and he was a great writer. So in, um, in two years, the business went from $100,000 as a startup to 6 million in revenue almost overnight with big um, articles like that, as well as um, their, their life science partners or their medical device products, Medtronic, j and Edwards Life Science, all the big ones started calling them saying, how do we engage you to help our doctors, our campaign leaders work on something that's not gonna injure or create a medical error in the marketplace? That's really fun. And that's, that's amazing. Still friends today, you know, speaking of full circle relationships. Um, this was not a pleasant topic to talk about. This next one, get stdtested.com. But um, it was a, an important topic. And again, going back to like, what is the message here? What's the why people are gonna care? Well. It was 2009, it was the Lehman Brothers crash and people were getting laid off left and right. And guess what they were doing? They were stuck at home all the time. <laughs> so every single department of health in the country was reporting an increase in STDs. And so we latched onto that statistic and we said, you know, people need to be worried. This trend is continuing. Um, and so overnight, an NBC story was picked up and NBC affiliates, other stations across the country, they said, oh, this has already been packaged. It's a really great story. Let's localize it in our market. So um, that, that story in the U.S. market to reach over 800,000 people, and it would have cost about $35,000 um, if it was advertising and not PR. It doesn't sound like a big number, but armed with that, a Wall Street Journal a health editor um, noticed that we'd pitched her for six months. She didn't pay attention to us. We finally, uh, I picked up the phone and called her one more time, and she had just gotten back from her OBGYN on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And she said to him, I have two college-age girls. How worried do I need to be about chlamydia? And he said, very worried. And guess who she called the next day? <laughs> me. And she said, tell me more about this online STD testing company that you're working with. Um, and so between the NBC story and the Wall Street Journal uh, story, um, it led to all kinds of new partnerships for them, new funding and new subscribers. And guess what? The original uh, clientele that they thought they were going to have, which was millennials, ended up being the 45 to 55 year old cheaters. So that was an aha moment um, with a company like that. Stericycle, I mentioned earlier, they, um, they were a $3 billion company and they were getting, they dominated healthcare, but medical uh, waste management was getting into medical. And so they got nervous and they wanted to stand out. And so over the course of seven years, um, we were able to get hospitals all across the country, hundreds of them to share their story with them. They wanted to talk about greening healthcare, and so it, um, it's a natural fit when you can let hospitals talk about your products and services so you don't have to. And pretty soon it was on the map in a big way and the share price kept reflecting the fact that the marketplace was telling their story, not just them. That was kind of exciting. Um, the Comer Family Foundation is the gentleman that started Land's End and they are incredible at supporting Chicago and the surrounding areas and others too, um, other states, other communities. And they, they, they saw that there was a public-private partnership that was gonna be needed if they were gonna build awareness for how there's a certain population that goes to federally qualified health clinics that is, is missing healthcare or they're, they're, there's no coordination of care between the ER they might go to or the federally qualified health clinic they might go to or a hospital. And so this platform brought together all these disparate points of view to help um, manage the safety net population. It was, it's a pretty big deal. Um, it was lauded across the country, medical home network was for other states that had big safety net populations that they weren't able or, or understood how to best manage it. So we tackled this from a lot of different ways and it was earned media for the most part, um, but the Associated Press is a great organization that stories are picked up around the world. So if you get in the Associated Press, you can bet it's gonna be picked up in a lot of different places. At the same time, a Chicago Tribune piece came out and a health leaders piece. 
So we also did a blog for Health Matters. So the fact that these reputable news media organizations were talking about Medical Home Network, it, it put them on the map overnight and they got invited um, to be recognized by the Healthcare Advisory Board. And this was a very new concept at the time that this happened. So it was fun. It's fun to launch things like that that help good people. And uh, Peapod, of course, everyone knows Peapod. Um, it's now a European owned company um, with a hold. And uh, they had these meal kits that were coming out. They're America's first online grocer, right? They were the ones that delivered groceries first to your home. And um, they decided that they had these chef inspired meal kits that they wanted the people to know about and mostly in the Chicago market. So we went out and we found um, 20 foodie Instagrammers that had a ball. We found this great venue in Lincoln Park called The Social Table. And it's two floors of executive kitchen and a great uh, dining room to eat in once you're done. It's cooking lessons, essentially. And we brought in these two chefs um, that, that went ahead and Jonathan Zaragoza of um, Barreria Zaragoza and Chef Cameron Grant of Osteria Lenghi. And uh, because they had two meal kits coming out, we wanted to prep and those meals in this kitchen and bring these Instagram or foodies into the same kitchen to rub elbows and to cook and to uh, imbibe at the end. And so at the end of one night, so three hours in a really cool venue with two cool chefs and these amazing Instagrammers that have, you know, seven to 25 to 50,000 followers each, um, there was almost a million shared impressions um, that came out over the course of a week. So it was a very fun influencer marketing event to work on. We did not know any of those foodie Instagrammers before that night happened. That's again, the power of research and uncovering the ones that you think can make the difference for your clients. So those are, those are some, some stories, Jeremy. I'm not sure if uh, any questions about them that you have. That was fantastic. I love it. Yeah, no, um, I think you do an amazing job explaining it. I just wanted you to work your magic. Thank you. Thank you. You know, that the, the one week client, I didn't tell you about, we don't have it in the slides yet, but um, it, it just happened recently, obviously because of COVID. But this gentleman that I raced sailboats with out in Utah, hence again, the sailing theme, he told me last summer, uh, I'm coming out with, I'm going to come up with a, a COVID test. And I said, really? And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, so is a hundred other people or maybe 500 other people. And he said, I'll keep you posted. I said, great. So fast forward four months and he calls and said, Kelly, we went from 700 entries in 38 countries down to the top 20. So you might want to put on your marketing hat and be ready for us. So again, I said, okay, let's see what happens. And in one month, they were the top five and they were the only antigen test that was selected to win a million dollars. So I said, Bill, what do you have right now for brand, for an assets or anything? And he said, I have a logo. I go, that's it. <laughs> okay, let's run with it. So overnight, we did a press release. We built a landing page and um, to be able to send people when they saw the release. And in 12 hours, I got calls from distributors, manufacturers, employers to, to test their employees with a new test. Um, the rapid test was 10 minutes instead of waiting uh, 10 to 14 days for the molecular PCR test. So new test solutions were needed. And um, on top of it, country officials from Italy, Turkey, and of course now India are calling to ask about the test. So there's still some regular hurdles, regulatory hurdles to go through for him, but it was really powerful to see overnight that, that, that so much attention was, was brought up with um, five news stories that appeared in 12 hours. So we love it. We love putting, putting companies on the map. That's amazing, Kelly. Um, first of all, thank you. Where can people find out more? Where should they go check out more? about you and the, your company? Um, you, know, you, can, you can email me or call me, um, but I, the Ballast Group, uh, it's a B-A-L-L-A-S-T, it's a -L -L -A G-R-O-U-P, hard, hard to uh, remember the spelling of it, ballastgroup.com, um, or my telephone, 312-751-3959. And it's just a pleasure to be on your show, Jeremy. Thank Amazing. you, especially twice. Amazing. Thanks, everyone. Check out ballastgroup.com. Check out more episodes of the podcast. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.